Hi, I'm Laurie Walsh. In this short presentation, we're going to discuss the role of PAP in dental bleaching. When we think about conventional dental bleaching, we tend to think about chemicals that are based on or closely related to hydrogen peroxide. For example, the adducts of hydrogen peroxide, where one chemical is joined on and it then releases it, such as carbamide peroxide or sodium percarbonate. There's also hydrogen peroxide releasing compounds, such as the perborates, which tend to be used for non-vital tooth bleaching, for example. And then the other member of the same family, of course, is ozone, triatomic oxygen. They all share some common chemistry, and that chemistry is around reactive oxygen species. They all, because they all end up working through hydrogen peroxide, also share some issues around stability. For example, hydrogen peroxide is normally shipped at an acidic pH to keep it nice and stable during storage and during shipping. All of the hydrogen peroxide family use reactive oxygen species and our body has got defense systems which can tolerate exposure to these reactive oxygen species but only up to a certain threshold which happens to be six percent. And this is why the ACCC and the poison schedule in Australia sets a boundary at 6% for products that can be dispensed by people who are not registered dental practitioners in Australia. Because of this exposure to ROS being a fairly common consequence in the human body, we've got quite good systems that have been developed to deal with small levels of exposure, such as catalase or glutathione peroxidase or antioxidant systems such as vitamin E. These can scavenge these reactive oxygen species, but they do cause us a number of issues in clinical practice when we overwhelm that system. And therefore, for redundancy, the body has a large number of different defense systems against reactive oxygen species. And there's also quite a few that are used synthetically often as preservatives, for example, in medicines or even in foods. The implications of reactive oxygen species for at-home bleaching is that we need to minimize contact of the gingival tissue with these ingredients. And this involves, for example, scalloping the trays and removing the excess of the bleaching gel. In terms of in-office bleaching, of course, we use a gingival barrier to protect the gingival tissues, the interdental papillae, and so on. And we use vitamin E as an antidote. So whenever we're using ROS at high concentrations in the mouth, it's essential to have really good gingival barrier protection. Otherwise, there will be burns on the gingiva and on the oral mucosa, such as the example shown here on the right-hand side. There are many other ways, though, that we can create oxidation and deliver oxygen. And shown on this slide are just some of the different ways that oxygen can be configured with various other molecules, and particularly with organic molecules, so those based on carbon. And in fact, there's been a whole raft of different families of compounds that either been found to exist naturally or been made synthetically, which can carry oxygen and can do oxidation. And these have been known about for well over 100 years because they're used extensively in industrial chemical processes. One family of these, the peracids or peroxy acids, as they're also known, are the ones that relate to the topic of this presentation, the PAP. This particular book was published in 1983, which was the year that I graduated. And in the chapter on peroxy acids, also called peroxy carboxylic acids, it goes through and describes all their major reactions, how they work, how they interact with different sorts of targets. And the chemistry of these is extremely well documented. The application of that chemistry in dentistry, though, is actually a fairly new type of concept. So how do these molecules work? Basically, instead of a carboxylic acid, which is a carbon with two oxygens and one hydrogen, this has an extra oxygen. So it's a CO3H rather than a CO2H. And as a result of that, 
the last oxygen is in this unusually unstable relationship where the hydrogen atom, the proton attached to it, basically oscillates over three different positions as shown on the slide here. The molecular part, which I've just represented by a blue blob, influences the overall stability of the molecule. If you make that larger, the molecule is more stable. Now these molecules have a particularly interesting feature, and that is that the last oxygen bond, which I've marked here in yellow on the slide, is the loosest of all these bonds, or the most reactive. And it's basically electron deficient. So it's going to go looking for rich sources of electrons. And those tend to be found in molecules that have got ring structures, and also in molecules with double bonds. It so happens that ring structures and double bonds are exactly the things that make molecules able to absorb light and therefore become chromogenic, the generators of color inside tissue. In other words, this type of chemistry targets colored molecules because of the nature of their chemical structure. And the reaction that's created is called an epoxidation. So you form an epoxide. Basically, the hungry oxygen attacks the electron-rich structure, and it forms this transient, unusual type of triangular complex, as you can see here. And these were first described around about 107 years ago for aromatic compounds and also for compounds with double bonds, such as the olefins, which are listed here in this particular paper from 1947. So this is a really well-established area of industrial chemistry. So let's now take that and apply that to PAP, thalimidoperoxycaproic acid. It has this hungry oxygen, which is going to attack the double bonds and the ring structures. And as that happens, it's going to form that little triangular epoxide product. And that itself will then further break down. But we've got rid of the double bond. And this is where the action of the bleaching actually occurs. So while we have a hungry oxygen at one end, the entire molecule itself is actually very, very large. And it has a very high specific activity. That means when we place it together, as in the series of reactions shown here, with double bonds or with molecules with ring structures, the reaction rate is very fast. In other words, it's very quick acting. So it's going to look for these particular molecules and react with them very, very quickly. That's different from the way that reactive oxygen species work. They'll often go off and do things like attack lipids through a process called lipid peroxidation. So the propensity to react with different targets is quite different. And this has implications for what they do on soft tissue, as we'll see in a moment. This paper looked at the difference between PAP and hydrogen peroxide and basically showed in terms of the overall effect that 5% of PAP, that's 5 grams per 100 mils, gave an effect that was similar to 3% hydrogen peroxide. Now, when you think about this in terms of the size, on the left-hand side, we've got PAP, which is just under 280 as a molecular weight. We've got hydrogen peroxide, which has got a molecular weight of just over 30. And most of that is actually oxygen, whereas in the PAP, only a very small amount of is oxygen. And this is because of this differential reactivity. The oxygen is much more unstable in the PAP version. And this is why in this paper, they talk about the greater reliability, the greater consistency. But there's also a beginning discussion in this paper about issues around safety. Now, the safety applies to two things, hard tissue and to soft tissue. So what they did in this study was to treat enamel slabs with either hydrogen peroxide at 6%, PAP at 5%, or PAP at 12% for 6 times 10 minutes. And then look at the surface under scanning electron microscope. The enamel at baseline doesn't look particularly interesting. It looks rather flat, and it looks exactly the same after PAP at either concentration. When you look at the surface after the 6% hydrogen peroxide commercial gel was used, you can see that there is some nanoscale roughness that's developed. 
Now, this isn't something new. This has been shown in a number of different studies, and it very much relates to the chemistry of the individual product which has been used. But the conclusion from this and similar studies is that PAP doesn't cause nanoscale roughness on enamel. In this second study, they looked at the way that the colors changed after people had been treated with a PAP product. And what they were particularly interested in was rebound in a short interval, which is typically due to remineralization. Because if you lose some of the enamel surface, obviously the saliva is going to try to replace that through remineralization. What they found what was really very nice was that there was shade stability over that following 24 hour period. So there wasn't a shade relapse due to remineralization, which can be a problem with gels that do upset the enamel surface at the nano scale. So if we look at their results, here we can see that there is a reduction in the tooth shade immediately from the baseline level, and that that result remains very stable over the following 24 hours. Now, obviously, there have been longer studies looking at relapse than just this one, but I just want to focus on this issue about safety for the enamel. In the placebo vehicle where there was no PAP, there was no change, and that's exactly what you would expect. So just trying to put some of the things together around what that looks like as a bleaching technology. First of all, there is epoxidation and there's no involvement of reactive oxygen species. That has implications because the things that cause lipid peroxidation, which is the ROS, are not present. So we have a technology that's not primarily irritant to oral soft tissues. And hence that can lead to a simplification, which means you don't need a gingival barrier. Now, the particular formulation of PAP with some enhanced chemistry is known as PAP+. And the high smile product is exactly that, both an at-home and an in-office. Where they differ is the concentration of the PAP active ingredient and also the pH, because the at-home product is neutral, the in-office is used at an elevated pH of 8.5. Regardless of which of these you use, because you don't have oxygen radicals and hydrogen peroxide penetrating through the tooth to reach the pulp, you don't go through the catalase neutralization response. So you don't get zingers. Because the gel will be sitting on tooth structure, the inclusion of an available source of potassium ions has a desensitizing effect, formulating the product with a very small particle size of nanohydroxyapatite means that you can get a high concentration of mineral phases, and that also stops enamel dissolution and softening. And this is where the plus comes from. It's those little alterations to the chemistry that effectively deal with many of the issues that could otherwise happen. So here's uh, an independent recent study which was done in the UK using PAP gel and looking at what was happening at the nanoscale. So on the upper left-hand side, we've got erosion of the surface in nanometers with nothing for the PAP plus gel or water, but some surface erosion, actual dissolution, creating small ledges and roughness for two of the hydrogen peroxide products, a 6% and a 35%, but nothing for the 35% carbamide peroxide. Looking at surface micro hardness, no change with water, a very slight increase in surface microhardness, almost certainly due to the nanohydroxyapatite component, but a reduction for the two hydrogen peroxides and also for the carbamide. And then finally, in terms of what it was doing to the shade of teeth, when teeth were stained in a consistent pattern using polyphenols, the actual magnitude of shade change measured digitally was much greater for the PAP than it was for the other commercial products. And this is good evidence that supports not only the efficacy around a color change, but also this whole issue of what's happening on the enamel surface. Let's now look at the, at the soft tissue. So here's a soft tissue of a patient treated recently at baseline. And here's the patient 45 minutes later. And you can see how the tooth shade has changed 
but the gingiva look exactly the same. Remember that these patients have been treated and exposed to gel all over the tooth surfaces and all over the gingiva with no gingival barrier. Now that's fundamentally different from what would be the case if we were using a hydrogen peroxide in office bleaching product. Let's look at some wider shots looking at befores and afters. So here's a before at 1M2 and here is the after going to 0.5 M1. Note how the teeth are shiny and lustrous and there is absolutely no change at all to the soft tissue. Let's look at another case. This is a 1M1 and it goes to a 0M1. Once again, the teeth look bright, the normal reflection pattern is seen and the soft tissues look perfectly normal. Let's include a third one, which is much more in the middle yellow range. So this is a 2M2 before and after going to a 1M1.5. In many situations where we'll be doing in-office bleaching with a hydrogen peroxide product, we'd be very worried about leaky restorations, cracks in the enamel, chips in the enamel, exposed dentine, exposed root surface, because those things would cause an A-delta sharp shooting pain. However, in this patient here, whose anterior teeth were treated, note that the tooth 2-2 is a pontic, so it's not going to change shade before and after. The tooth surfaces have lightened, but the patient didn't experience any zingers, it didn't experience any sensitivity, despite having some chipped tooth surface, and once again, the soft tissues look great. During the procedure, you can see on the upper right-hand side, the gel all over the teeth and the gingival tissues. Let's look at the lower teeth in the same patient. Here they are before, and here they are immediately after. Once again, we have teeth with normal reflections at a lighter color and no soft tissue reactions. So let's try to put all that together into some key take home messages for the in-office product. And let's focus on the benefits for patients and then on benefits for clinicians. So for the patient, first of all, it's going to be a shorter time in the chair because the procedure of applying the gel is actually less complex. It's a simplified procedure. Secondly, we've got safety for the hard tissue because the nanohydroxyapatite prevents mineral dissolution because it saturates the gel with available mineral so that the process of mineral loss is not going to happen against that gradient of concentration. And there is available potassium ions in large amounts, and that's going to protect any exposed root surface, any exposed dentine. It's going to prevent sensitivity. In terms of the dental pulp, because there's no oxygen reactive species, no hydrogen peroxide, there's no zingers during the treatment, nor is there afterwards, which of course is an enormous benefit to the patients. And finally, in terms of soft tissue safety, there's not going to be any risk of chemical burns to the oral mucosa, the lips, the tongue, nor of irritation to the gingiva. So there is no need to apply vitamin E cream all over the tissues afterwards. And then finally for the clinician, the in-office product is, as I mentioned earlier, a little bit different from an at-home version because it works at a higher pH. And this potentiates the bleaching action and the product is at a higher concentration. But it's still safe to be in contact with the soft tissue. Really, the fundamental benefits are all around saving time. A simpler application process, literally mix and apply. No need for a gingival barrier and a material that chemically is designed to be more reactive and therefore attack colored molecules faster than hydrogen peroxide. And of course, all importantly, the clinical outcomes can be reached without problems of dehydration, without demineralizing the surface, and therefore achieving a more stable shade and less rebound and a more consistent bleaching effect. And the cases I've just shown you which were all done recently in Queensland, are just representative of the sorts of results which occur with this type of technology. Because we're using something which is less dangerous to soft tissue, there's also less vigilance, less worry about the product leaking and burning and those sorts of things, which are very much in the top of one's mindset when you're doing in-office bleaching using very high concentrations of hydrogen peroxide. So that's another benefit for the clinician 
in terms of peace of mind during the procedure. So putting all that together, I hope you can see why I think this could be a really exciting new direction, new direction for dentistry, but certainly not a new direction in terms of the use of peroxycarboxylic acids for bleaching. They've been used in laundry products, they've been used in industrial bleaching, bleaching of paper and textiles and things like that. It's just been the transitioning of that technology into the dental environment that seems something that's very new. So I thank you for your attention and I hope you found the presentation interesting.